islands are places that have always fired the human imagination with tales of mighty heroes and their epic deeds. Sailing in the Hebrides, you can see with your own eyes how these islands inspired the myths and legends of old, helping to shape the culture of the nation. This isn't just beautiful scenery, it's food for the imagination, a storyteller's dream. The spectacular rocky peaks of the Black Coolan on the Isle of Skye rise to over 3,000 feet above the sea. This is the impressive summit of Blaven, an outlier of the main Coolan range. These are mountains that inspire poetry. The great 20th century Gaelic poet Solly McLean made many references to the Kula Mountains and to Blaven in his work. And even if I came in sight of paradise, what price its moon without Blaven? The first recorded ascent of Blaven was made by two drunken 19th century intellectuals, the gay poet Algernon Swinburne and his friend John Nicholl, who was a professor of English at Glasgow University. The pair spent the summer of 1857 on sky, mostly in a drunken stupor, it has to be said, but between drinking bouts, they did manage to summon up enough energy to climb Blaven, which they mistakenly believed to be the highest mountain on sky. Instead of replicating Swinburne and Nichols' drink-sodden achievement, I'm taking a different approach. I'm not going to climb Blaven, but to explore underground, descending into a netherworld of darkness, bones, and ancient myth. Just working our way up towards Boom Passage. I'm glad I've got my Wellingtons on. My guide to the underworld is archaeologist Stephen Birch, who spent the last 10 years excavating a limestone cave system in the shadow of Blaven. After 10 minutes bent double, we finally emerge into the Bone Cave, where Steve made his extraordinary discoveries. We were working at the site, an archaeological excavation, started in 2003, um, so several years a year, and um, a really amazing site came, came to light. Just behind me, you'll see we've got this arching limestone cave roof, and that was the original entrance into this cave system. And Excavations outside uncovered a sequence of three different stone-built staircases. What Steve and his team found in the cave are some of the rarest and most intriguing artefacts ever to appear in the Scottish archaeological record. It was like a treasure trove. There was animal bone, there was pottery, there was stone tools, bone points, bone needles. And I thought, wow, something's quite exciting is happening here. The objects in the Bone Cave cover a span of almost 5,000 years of human history, from the Stone Age to the Iron Age builders of the Brochs. Since we carried out the excavations, we've been able to look at other cave sites around the world, or closer to home even, places like Ireland. Um, we've got inklings now to suggest that there was unusual things going on in caves. I think they were seen as otherworldly places. They were this transitional place between the upper world, the world of the living. It was a place where you could perhaps communicate with the ancestors or, or, or to make special offerings to those deities who dwelt in these very unusual places below the ground. So this is a sacred site, really, isn't it? Or was a sacred site? It all points to people visiting this site almost as a pilgrimage type site on a periodic basis, maybe just family groups coming at certain times periodically through the year, but then we have evidence to suggest that perhaps big groups of people were coming um, at certain types of year, maybe on these big Celtic festivals like Savane or Beltane. It's amazing the atmospheric, isn't it? The it hairs is. in the back of my neck <laughs> begin to rise in describing that scene. But there is something almost tangible about you know, elemental of the past here. Have you ever felt anything? Uh, yes, I think, you know, even lifting the objects out of the ground, I think every object that came out, some more than others, they do 
give a tingle, as you say, on the back of your neck. And certainly working in this site, especially in the early years, there was only three of us in the first year working inside this passage. And making that journey from the caver's entrance down the streamway, sometimes, you know, making that journey alone, you have a little look over your shoulder, you think you've heard something, or maybe it's a presence. I think, yes, there's something very tangible about this place being underground. The ancestors are just behind us. Yes, that's right. Back on the surface, Steve shows me the layout of this once sacred site. This is where he made the most remarkable discovery of all, a fragment of a musical instrument, an ancient lyre. So here it is. What is this? So this is a, a laser scanned model, if you like, uh, of the original mm -hmm. lyre bridge. So well, the original has been uh, the, has been dated by material associated with it in the fireplace, if you like, and it's dated to between four and 500 BC. So, and that's a very significant find as far as you're concerned. Yes, yeah, I think because it's so unique, uh, you oh. know, it's the earliest evidence in Western Europe from this time of a string musical instrument. Is it really? Wow. And I imagine the technology to produce that 2,500 years ago would have been relatively sophisticated. That's right, that's right. In order to make those precise grooves, and that's perfectly angled as well, to sit on the, the body of the, of the musical instrument. That's right. We're still learning more about it mm -hmm. as time goes on. So we can not only look at how the object was manufactured, but how it sounded as well, uh -huh. with a replica. Uh -huh. And what tunes they would have played And what it. type of tunes they yeah. would have played. The Hebrides are rich in archaeology. And my next journey into the past takes me to the island of Colonsay and beautiful Killoran Bay to meet local historian Kevin Byrne. The find here is an example of how early invaders of Colonsay found themselves influenced by the people they came to conquer. Kevin, what are we looking for here? Well, uh, we're close to the site of uh, a quite an important Viking ship burial. It's the only known Viking ship burial anywhere in which there are Christian associations. Why do you think they chose this site? Uh, I think probably for two reasons. A, it's extraordinarily beautiful looking out across Killoran Bay. This was actually within sight of Iona. Uh -huh. And the association, therefore, with St. Columba will have been very important at that time. So there was a spiritual dimension here already? Well, there certainly was. In 1882, archaeologists came here to investigate a raised mound. They discovered that hidden under the sand was a remarkably well-preserved Viking burial ship. What would the early archaeologists have seen here? Well, as far as I can see, it would have been uh, about this long, in the order of about 30 feet altogether, and had been upturned to cover the entire burial site. But within that burial site, there had been a walled enclosure the stones at each end had got a deeply inscribed cross. These were Christian Vikings then? Yes, Christianized. They had adopted the signs and symbols of Christianity. Within the uh, enclosure, there was a man buried about here, uh -huh. and he had with him a lot of important grave goods. He had an iron pot, he had a long, typical Viking sword, and there were three coins. The traditional money offering buried with the dead, which was to pay the ferryman. And in particular, the most important feature of all was as he was crouched up in the cavity that was uh, protected by his arms was a, an important and very beautiful uh, set of scales and set of weights, which were decorated with uh, inlay on top of lead. It seems to be a link with Christianity. The discovery of these scales was hugely significant. Some early Christians believed that Saint Michael the Archangel was responsible for escorting the souls of the dead to heaven. It was his task to weigh up their sins and virtues using his set of scales. It seems as if this departed Viking had got with him uh -huh. belt and braces, he'd got a coin for the ferryman, some coins for the ferryman, and he'd also got the symbol which would make him attractive to uh, St. Michael the Archangel. When the discovery was made more than a hundred years ago, it was thought to be a merchant's grave. 
but Kevin believes the evidence points to it being the last resting place of someone much more important. The trappings with which he was, the burial is associated are of such high status that this seems to me much more likely to have been the burial site of a local leader, and the local leader who would spring to mind from that very date is um, Jarl Gilly of Colonsay. Now, if it were to be the grave of Jarl Gilly, it would be particularly interesting because his great-grandson was Summerlet, who was the founder of the Lordship of the Isles and the progenitor of every MacDonald on Earth. <laughs> so it would be extremely interesting if any of these bones were available uh -huh. and if anybody could extract DNA to compare the DNA of the incumbent of this grave with genuine MacDonald DNA today. It would be a very interesting thing if one could go all the way back to that early date. The techniques of 1882 and 1883 would have been of limited value. Uh, it would be a good time for this important gravesite, which is acknowledged as of outstanding importance, to be re-examined by modern archaeology. It would be a really exciting thing to yeah. try to do. Well, it's amazing to think that on this site, yes, the Viking was laid to rest. Yes, laid to rest here, and now one of the major displays in the magnificent new museum in Edinburgh. And do you think there are other graves yet to be discovered? Yes, I'm sure Colossi has very many more secrets to reveal.